So, hören mich alle gut? Can everybody hear me well? All right, welcome to this presentation by Lingbit from Vienna. My name is uh, Robert Altmüller. I'm a software developer and also trainer at Lingbit. And I am going to introduce something to you. I'm going to introduce a high availability presentation today and also the connection to our products and DHDPD, of course. And maybe I'm going to ask a question first of all. Does anybody know the APD? I see a few hands raised here. I'm glad to see that. I think most of you have uh, worked with version 8 or earlier, but today's presentation is going to be about the next generation, of course also the comparison um, to the previous version. So today we're going to talk about version 9. Um, in comparison to version 8.3, there were only little upgrades here, but version 9 is a really major release in comparison to the versions 8 and earlier. So the biggest difference here is that uh, version 9, you can have multiple applications, and that now we also have the opportunity to, um, for administration purposes of the system. I'm going to start uh, with high availability first. So this is really where this whole thing is based, DRBD. So when we de developed DRBD, we really wanted high availability, really the cluster system here. And that was really what, what it was all about for us, because the problem here that we usually have is if you look at clustered systems, the problem is really having the data on all the different compute nodes. So that's why you always have to have the current event here. So High availability in this case, what it's all about is having a system and making sure that there are no interruptions here. Of course, you can't only have a cluster system for that. The cluster system itself doesn't make it where you have a complete high availability uh, product, but it is really one way to make sure that there are no dysfunctions. Of course, um, this is about hardware, if a machine breaks, for example, and also if you, of course, if the hardware just doesn't work temporarily, for example, because there's no energy and things, of, things like that, then it breaks. That's really what it's all about. And if that is the case, then the cluster really gives you the opportunity to really switch really quickly from the already running standby system. And of course, that is really the whole point here. Therefore, you really can reduce the downtime dramatically. If you, for example, have a system that just shut down, and you start um, repairing it, by the time you repair it, actually, it's a long time. So you can really eliminate downtime here, or at least reduce it. So with those cluster systems, the um, problem is data consistency. We are going to talk about the topic that I want to present today. So that's really our approach here, to have this data in a cluster and making it available on all nodes. And of course, um, that was used to be two or four. That was so-called stacking. I'm going to talk about that in more detail later on. But as I mentioned, it was uh, mainly two nodes. That's really what most of our customers do. So two node cluster, clusters, we are able to replicate the data here. And now we can build bigger clusters here. So you can also see the DRBD Manage. That is on my first slide here. And DRBD Manage is also very new here. And I'm going to introduce that as well during my presentation today. So let's look at the concepts first. Looking at um, data availability here. So this is the concept that most of you know, I'm sure. It's called shared everything. I'm not sure if anybody else is using that as well, but what that is, that is really what we name it in Limbit. And this is really um, what you have when you have a cluster system and the data is central on a shared uh, storage uh, area network, for example. 
if it's located there, so there's one central system and that is uh, here and usually there's an access node accessing it and if there's a failover, then this node of course is then separated from the central point and the other node is using the same connection and the same data um, standard here. So that really means the data is only there once on the central level. Um, so that's from CMD, Cisco, and so on. And the problem with this installation is that, of course, there's a single point of failure. So that really means that these systems are sometimes are very redundant um, and there's mirroring and all that. So that really doesn't protect it from the fact that data can get lost or that there really can be a big interruption if the whole system, system breaks down. Um, and that's just the problem with redundancy here. And also, of course, the financial aspect is important here as well. So of course, that also doesn't protect it if there really is a problem. For example, if it burns down, then of course, there's nothing you can do anymore. Okay, so our approach is very different here. We call it shared nothing. In that case, there's not one central system, but instead we have two separate options here. So with DRBD, what we do is you have the data in this cluster system only on the places where they actually need it, and then you replicate them locally from one cluster node to the next cluster node. And the other option is that you then have a redundant system under it that also has two nodes and then you have the option to replicate that with DRBD and then you use that system for example as a ISCRT target so in that way you have the cluster nodes and it's very normal as a connection so, of course, there are some advantages and disadvantages as well for those concepts. I'm going to show you the earlier one here again. The advantage in this case is that it's centrally here and there's one definite data standard. If you change that, then, of course, you don't have to make sure that you synchronize it. That is really the advantage here, but the disadvantage is the single point of failure. In our concept, the single point of failure is eliminated and that, therefore, that's good, but then again, you have uh, disadvantages really small that you have the data twice. So that, of course, is also an advantage. It's a disadvantage and advantage at the same time, having the data double, double. That really means you can lose one system completely, the whole heart with all the data, but you still have all the data then because you have it twice. So you really can then implement it into a new system here. You can really replace the system if it breaks, and then you can just sync it very easily. So that really means means you can bring it back to the original state very quickly, and then you can start again from there. The only disadvantage here is that you really need just more room. Of course, that's not a big a cost factor, but if you compare it with um, what you really pay for storage area networks here. So it does make sense. It's probably the more affordable option here. And um, the reason for that is, and that is the next topic, that's the key features. The next point is that we um, work with shelf components here. That really means that you have the storage that's being synchronized and replicated, completed with all the shelf components here. So you really can pick your hardware. It's um, running everywhere Linux could run. And everywhere, what I mean by everywhere is not only all um, x86 or d64 servers which is really what most systems um, do, but also it's even more neutral than that. You can use the Raspberry Pi. A colleague of mine actually tried that. You can actually run it there, so on a very small system as well. So you can install Linux. Um, I think that's a good architecture. All the way up to really big ones, that's the IBM Power 8, for example, the P-Series. And we have it running both systems. My colleague has it in Raspberry with a USB sticks that actually works as well. So it's every block storage that you can use on Linux actually works. 
and we also have it running on a cluster made up of two RMBP series with other processor architectures. So that really means that it really is independent from the processor architecture as well as independent of the size of the system and also of the type of block device as far as there are some conditions that are being met, of course. It is also neutral in terms of application, also the cluster manager. So that means it doesn't work with the cluster file system where you actually have to have a certain file system, and that is then limited to what you can use it for. But DRBD is only making sure that data blocks are then replicated on the basic one. So that really means that not every time there is a, a full synchronization organization necessary, you can also just copy data so that all works in increments. So if the system, for example, is not connected for a while, if you have a system A, system B, for example, and system B is then not, not uh, working for um, a week because it has to be relocated, for example, then as soon as system B is then connected again with system A, you can say that all changes are then being replicated. So not the whole storage has to be synchronized, but only the incoming data that have changed in the um, time in between are being synchronized. So all this is working without any special hardware. Special hardware, if you want to call it that, would also be back to write caches. And special hardware is also something we do recommend. It's not necessary, but it does give you higher performance, of course. So really, overall, we can say that, to summarize it, you do not need a special hardware, but it is an advantage to have sometimes. So one of the biggest advantages here is also the, that there's no vendor lock-in. So that really means we do develop it, but it's an open source product. It's under GPL, and it's also in the mainline Linux channel. So as soon as you have the kernel.org and you download it, you have that included as well. Of course, not the latest version because that always takes a little while until it's actually there but it is available so you do get the latest version with us we also have a list of links in the end where you can actually um, download them so overall I can say that over the years over many years already it's part of the uh, Linux core. So really, if there is no problem here right now, but even if there's a problem in the future, then there's nothing um, that would keep us from having this product being used by other organizations or uh, companies. So you can modify it, you can package it yourself, and so on. And that is really what we are using right now, what's happening right now for example, a CheckMK appliance, the box you see in the back, that is already being used there. It's version 8 in this case. And that is making it where all this data in this cluster system are available for both sides. So overall, why do you want to use it? One of the main points here is the performance, and that is the point where DRBD is uh, way ahead of the cluster systems here because we um, replicate blocks and not the whole file system here with all the locking that would be necessary for that. And that's why we can be in the active, active one. It's not only primary, but also active, active. So a regular file system, we can really have a resource being active on one side and the other. And that really means that it's the um, resources on one side and the other side they are replicated. So in these setups, we can really reach very high performance all the way up to 160,000 IOPS. And um, that is just a very high number here. So really, that is a lot more than what you get with empty um, cluster files here. I think it's 20 times more about uh, what you can get with typical cluster file systems, um, especially in terms of IOPS performance. 
Okay, I would like to um, really explain to you how it's set up, DRBD8. This is only 8 for 9. It's very similar, but um, there are just more than two nodes. So the orange part here is the Linux kernel and the components it's made up of, and one of the components is DRBD. So that's really the central part. So the uh, Linux kernel module is really the core part here. And everything that's on top here, that's very abstract here. That's the service. That's the user space where you have all applications run in. And that really means that all the applications that you need here, um, of course, m modifying them and so on. And then in this uh, Linux kernel, there is also a few caches in between. One of them is not here. That's the buffer cache. And then we also have a filing system over it. Of course, that's not necessary. There are a few products like the Oracle database, for example, that is um, really putting the data straight to where they need to be. You can do that with DRBD as well. As I said, we are application neutral and also neutral in terms of file bases. But um, of course, there's also the option of doing it like here. And then also there's the DRBD module in the middle where it's being split up. And then it's going to the local side once and then also um, going to, through the network and then going to the backup system. and. Of course, is then also accessing the storage system here. So whatever blocks you have there, that's where it's going. And the same is then happening on the other side here. So with the backup system, it is being acknowledged. And only if that is all complete, then the application is then being told that it is yeah completed. So that really means that the system call is only coming back then at that point in time. OK, so what that means is we have a question here, OK? Do you have any experience in terms of performance that the service that is actually giving the order has to take longer or takes longer because of the replication? Well, you can actually measure that, but uh, like I said, in terms of performance, we're doing really well. Usually what I would say is, is that what the bottleneck could actually be with DRBD is the network in between, because that is really what is added here. So what's important is, is that you really have a high bandwidth here, because um, here that you might have the problem that you sometimes have the round trip time twice. So um, just going from A to B. And the package then really has to be provided to the backup system then it also has to be acknowledged here. So that really does take a little bit longer. But if you have a, a wide bandwidth, then it really doesn't have an impact that it actually does work. So you really are very close to the um, other performance. So really, if you just compare it, then there's not a very big difference. So for long distance replication, you also have the opportunity to avoid this uh, full in synchronized one. So then, of course, the uh, guarantee, the sync guarantee is then a little bit lower, but then that can be improved with an older um, product, the RBD proxy. That's the uh, commercial part here. And with the proxy, you have the opportunity to have very slow one, um, for example, um, slow long distance replication, then you can um, buffer them, so to say. So really in cases where you really have um, high impact in some areas that are then impacting the long distance link. So it can't happen live. You can't replicate it live. You can do that via the proxy and buffer it locally. And then you can use the time later in order to really use the, ba use the bandwidth in between those two locations and then just replicated later on. Second question? Yes, I have a question as well. So does that mean that if I have O-Direct and I access with F-Sync, for example, that you only then get it back on the second node and then it's only then then you get it? Yeah, with the sync modus, that's actually true protocol C here. That's the advantage of the solution. This is actually then with O-Direct, it's only coming back if the data really was on both a 
systems, and they are then on the storage of both systems. Okay, so that means that if I use the async sync mode, then O-Direct is coming back straight away, and then it probably guarantees that it's on the local one, but then on the re remote one, it's only going to get buffered. Yes, and then you could put that proxy in between, that's then buffering it in between. So, of course, you could then have this additional guarantee. And then you know how these um, blocks are is then guaranteed? Yes, yes. With the replication, that is uh, true. It is guaranteed, but with resync, the order is not guaranteed. Because, for example, if it was disconnected for a while and then you need to resync again, then you have this site that was disconnected for a while that wasn't replicated. Then you have consistent old data, and then in order to have the old consistent um, data and then get old con uh, new consistent data, you have to actually go back, and then you have all these um, blocks in the back, so the um, replication is happening um, synonymously, and then this sync is then going from low to high addresses. So while the sync is running, the backup system is very inconsistent for a very short time, so until the sync is done, then it is consistent again. Okay, was that answer good? Yes. Okay, so that is also a very important point right now that um, is very important to us. If the high availability between two cluster systems is really what DRBD is all about, because then everything is just very um, synchronized, it can happen simultaneously. So. Um, it really does only end if the data is really available on both systems and are stored there. So then if there's an interruption, for example, for the first system where the application was active, and then you have the cluster failover with the backup system, then you can guarantee that the last data you actually wrote is still available there, and that you really there's no time time gap in between. So that really means the last 10 seconds weren't lo lost or something like that. Okay, so that was really uh, DRBD 8 up until now. Let's talk about 9 and the comparison to 8. So for DRBD 9, we um, extended it, so now we have up to 31 connections per resource that you can open, and that means this DRBD is uh, not only uh, replicating the individual storage device, but you can have, um, you can configure as many resources as you want with their own connections that can be replicated and these resources can then have several um, volumes in terms of configuration and they all have the same connection that they're being replicated with so that means for example if you have a database running on there and you have the d data and also the data lock and you want to replicate both it's guaranteeing that this connection is either um, available for both volumes or is not working for both volumes at the same time, so that really means that they're always in the same state here. So they are always very consistent. As I mentioned before, we have several resources here, up to 31 connections. So that means up to 32 systems can be in that same uh, network. And then a new feature here is the auto-promote. Uh, who knows DRBD8 knows that you have pr uh, a primary side and a secondary side. So the primary side is the one where the application is running. and then then also where you access it, and then DRBD9, it is the case that the secondaries are all machines, and that means that you, you all them access them simultaneously. So for writing, you need primary, but to read it secondary, so the primary mode here doesn't have to be reactivated, but there's a new feature that's called auto-promote, and that makes it where the first node that is trying to open this data, that block device, opening the block device, for example, then automatically promotes to the primary mode here, as long as there is not another one in the primary mode already. So um, that's, of course, 
something everybody knows. So what's also new here is also that we have several different transports available. With DRBD 8, we would always have MTCP. But now with 9, we can also MSCTP or RDMA. RDMA is uh, especially good with uh, remote direct access. And that is a new protocol that is very interesting in certain cases where you have data that is going to go to the main memory of the target device and also you prevent a lot of copying work here and that is also very interesting. So this transport mo module are now split out of the main one here. So DRBD now has a two kernel module. So the one is the actually primary one, replication, and then the second one is the train spot module that you down or load it. So um, RDMA, I have to say, is an add-on. So that means that RDMA, it, that's more of a commercial part that we are selling in addition to it. The rest is still hardware and software. So the comparison between 8.4 and 9 is that um, DRBD 8, it was necessary to have two uh, to administer two nodes. So you had configuration files for all the individual resources. Then you have them on, copied them on cluster nodes. And then you were able to use them on both, both cluster nodes. For 9, that would actually take too long. So you can see that down here, if you just look at it, DRBDM and also the setup that is actually the tool chain you can see here for DRBD 8.4. But if you now imagine that for version 9, you have up to 32 different ones, then of course that's a problem because now if you want to make a change, for example, then you want to avoid really having to edit it uh, once and then copying to all other systems again and again manually. So that would actually be too much work. And for that reason, we also have changed something in terms of um, administration here. So this is what it looks like now. Up there, there's a new la layer. That's the DRBD manage. That's the command line interface here. And the demo is a background process here. And this background process is using DRBD. So it's a control volume of DRBD as a central database. And then it's replicating the configuration that you're putting in to all all of the appropriate nodes, and then it's also um, taking over control of DRBD and also the back end here. So we have the LVM um, ones as an example here, that's uh, Linux. And of course, there's the opportunity to have um, attached different storage backends. So what that means is that you don't have to have the same storage backend on each node but it could also be a storage system behind it. It can just be um, different things. What else is there? Ice guys, targets. You could use that as well in this remote system. So any type of block device, you could also write a, a module here. That would maybe be a little bit old fashioned, but it's possible. But the what the um, DRBD Manage does is you just enter what kind of size of volume you need and then how often you want to replicate that and then MDRBD manages then looking for the cluster that you actually set up. It's looking for systems where there's enough storage capacity available and then it puts all the block devices right there, for example, with the um, RVN logical volumes, and then it's putting the block devices right there, and then it also gives the metadata that you need for that and starting to track what kind of data needs to be replicated and what doesn't. And then it initializes this and does know automatically with the replication that it has to configure. So really, this block device then is a replicated DRBD device on your system. So that means it's a complete automization environment here, so over the DRBDR.
So the architecture looks as follows. As I just mentioned, there's the command line interface, and that is being attached by DBus and the daemon and the daemon is the managed server and that is then using a control volume that is between the individual cluster nodes with DRBD9 replicated and is telling all the systems what the current configuration is and then there are certain triggers that uh, within the DRBD the demons and the other ones know that data changed for example. So then we also have the opportunity of having the common line enter phase with um, to script it, that is something that you've all seen before. You can do that with a command line in the interactive mode if you don't want to script it, but you can also um, do it just like a new jellyability and with uh, JavaScript, for example, you can also configure things automatically. Um, on the other hand, you also have the os possibility to have your own application at the DRBD managed server and then use the API from the managed one and then control it with managed. So that really means that you also have the possibility to have your own applications, your own um, surfaces for graphics and so on, and you can develop them yourself self and also have different management environments that can be included that happen sometimes in virtualization environments, for example, Cinda, OpenStack, where DRBD Manage has their own um, section here. But we are also working with Proxmox that also integrates that into their virtualization. Here we see an example for volume management, which is supposed to show the advantages of DBD9 in comparison to DRBD Manage. So we have resources here that are distributed over the system. So the size of the blocks in total is the size of the storage. You have resource A, for example, that's between it's replicated between the first two systems. Uh, B is being replicated on three systems. Resource C and D are only uh, C and E are only on the last two systems, and resource D is being distributed on the three systems on the right. So you can have resources in four systems, and you can distribute them uh, flexibly. So you don't have to have every information in every part of the cluster. I mean, this can be freely distributed. Every resource can have its own setup, really. Now, if we have no more um, no more storage available to add more resources, then we can also uh, just add a node and just uh, expand the storage system accordingly. So as it looks now, I mean, this won't really help much because we cannot replicate a lot. So we have an empty system here and many full systems. I mean, this needs to be swapped accordingly. And, well, to create some space for replication. And to that end, we have the possibility to do some rebalancing. So short term, this volume D is being uh, replicated once more. So then it's for a short period of time, it exists four times so that we can take it out of the original node. So the other three nodes remain. One part is on the new node. And this way, the resources can be redistributed to create um, memory or storage on the uh, other resources. So we can, for example, now add F, which wasn't uh, available before. So the advantage with DRDB9 and DRBD Manage, it has become very simple to just um, redistribute resources within the cluster. So now it is really simple to take a resource and migrate it from one system to the next. With DRDB8, um, this problem didn't occur because there were only two nodes. But I mean, this problem did occur in DRDB9, and yeah, a solution was provided right away. So about DRDB Manage itself, we call it a provisioning solution because it has an automated uh, administration 
capability. It's programmed in uh, Python because this is very popular these days. It has become more popular in many Linux systems. It is pre-installed in most Linux distributions. And in the community, it seems to be very popular as well. So we hope that this will lead to or we hope that it's it's being programmed in a nice and clean language and that many people in the community will take part in continuing the development. Right now it's imagining logical volumes and other storage uh, concepts can be implemented via plugin and we can also manage snapshots with it. It's also possible to, and it's implemented as well, to have a thinly provisioned storage, so SYN LVs, logical volumes that do not actually um, allocate all the memory that is requested right away and instantly, but uh, they have a relative size that is being covered and uh, this is easier to make snapshots uh, like this from the from the resources because you can have a copy and write snapshots. I mean, they are very small, and only after the data in the target volume uh, in the source volume changes, then this is being copied again, and then this new volume is growing gradually. So you can take a lot of snapshots without having uh, to use up lots of the memory all the time. I mentioned the other things down here, basically what we're working on, it's not quite implemented yet, is an accessory to DRDB managed to have thousands of nodes. And the concept behind this is that we don't only use the control volume by itself, but we also have a TCP IP server that can control uh, satellite nodes. So externally, there will be nodes that you can add uh, on which you have to install DRDB9, and then these nodes you can basically control via remote through TCP, through TCP and so you can still put uh, things on the nodes that you had before, but the total cluster can just be uh, grown pretty much infinitively. We're talking about thousands of, of potential nodes, and those can uh, replicate their resources up to 32 times each in a computing cluster. Maybe this is interesting for those who are um, working with virtualization. This is pretty much the concept that's behind OpenStack Nova as well. So Nova nodes could also be um, dealt with in a nice way. So before I to a little live presentation. I have a short link collection here where you can find more information. It's about the company Linbit, like simply linbit.com, but also the source packages and repositories can be downloaded under DRDB, linbit.com. Those are the commercial offers with support. You can go to oss.linbit.com who would like to have the source packages for compiling them themselves. And then git.drdb.org. If you're looking for a source repository and want to clone that directly, we can go there and probably start working on it. So the latest version is always there uh, from DRDB. Now in, in version 8, it's 8.4.6, and in 9, it's 9.00. That's the most recent versions. And for pre-compiled binary packages, we have our support planned. If anybody cares, uh, just send an email to office at limbit.com. And there you will also have the opportunity to request demos. So any questions to this point? Yes, we need the microphone. Ah, yeah, it's here. Perfect. <laughs> Have you got a typical like, application case? I mean, I do understand this EGPEC cluster, but why would I have 31 copies of the one and the same thing? Yeah, well, good point. I mean, of course, if you have 
like maximum security, you would have up to three to six copies probably. So really mission critical areas where uh, maybe two or three systems aren't enough. Which has become more interesting is off-site replication. Like you have two or three systems which are on-site in production facility where the operations are happening, but then somewhere further away, maybe like a few kilometers in a different uh, in different city, you have like a, a recovery center with servers there, so you have two nodes there, so that if one plant really shuts down completely, which has happened before, I mean, I've, I've witnessed this once uh, with an insurance company that we were working with, and it really happened that entire service plants were flooded and uh, the entire location, including all the IT, was being flooded and destroyed. So then it's always nice to have a main site which is in the cluster and then have two or three nodes there with a like and also a backup uh, site for re recovery so there would be a four to six node cluster with drdb8 you could do that i mean you could have up to four nodes uh, in stacking so drdb based on drdb so well you stack them basically it was configured in a way that one DRDB layer would use another DRDB layer as a backup block and there was a lot of overhead and it was a bit of difficult to com configure it, but now in DRDB 9 this is much easier. You can have a configuration, uh, uh, like a configuration for three nodes is the same uh, difficulty as a two node uh, config and the stacking was yeah a bit of an issue in DRDB 8, but in DRDB 9 um, this offsite replication, which was quite common, um, this stacking is no longer in place. So, yeah, that's an advantage. Larger configurations up to 32 nodes may be in place for clusters or may be interesting for clusters for virtualization where the VM is uh, uh, can be ex or can be moved out to a, to a hyperwonder because you can very quickly distribute these resources and maybe you don't have to have 32 replicating systems like 32 systems that basically all have backend storage and then you have the data 32 times but to have like some certain core maybe four servers that actually have the data and then use db9 clients so the rest of the systems like the 28 systems that are left would be the DB drdb9 clients that can read and write the data but locally they do not have a storage so it would be an ice casi so they are being delivered by the system they can be changed but they're not being written on the local look, uh, site so there's only those four servers replicating it i mean that would be an idea I have two questions. First would be load balancing. You said this is done manually, or can this be also automated? Rebalancing of resources um, is manual these days. So you tell the RDB manage uh, and add a node, and it's, it's semi-automatic. Like it's a triple de replicated resource. I can uh, give it the command. Um, make it four, and then it will look for a fourth node, and then I can like take one of the original three out of it, so it's two steps. What we cannot do yet, but what's on the roadmap, is a capability to have uh, to remove one system from the cluster, because maybe it's just defective, and the storage is gone, and then you just tell the RDB, uh, please re replicate the, the state we had before. So like rebalance all the resources as a command. That is something that we were working on. My second question would be for the number for version 8. There was a GUI that you could download somewhere, like a Java console thing. How about the new version? It's not available for the new version yet. Um, I think you're talking about the GUI, right? Yeah, like ad administrating, uh, getting in there, playing around with it. Well, right now there is just a common line interface for DMDB manage. What we're working on is a web interface that is based on DRDB Manage and um, make it like web browser configurable. That is something we're working on. Well, will that be available like that, or is that uh, a pay issue? Well, I, I don't know. I have to ask that. We're planning to do this. And what we have already are 
drivers, drivers for uh, virtualization environment, where Cinta or Improxmox or something, I mean, we've, we've played around with that, where you don't have to really care about DRDB, but you just say on the, on the level uh, virtual machine, new virtual machine, and then behind that there is a connection driver between the virtualization environment and the human being that there's some, that is actually happening. And yeah, in order to make it more understandable, maybe I can show you what it looks like. Maybe I will have to zoom in a bit. So this is the cluster environment. I cannot see my mouse cursor very well. And there is also DRDB manage. So the this is the, the surface I have there. I have a four node cluster. This is the list that you get out of DRDB manage in DRDB9 in which I can see which systems are configured. It's a summary basically. So the detailed information isn't even here. I mean, of course, you can you can request those. The same goes for the list of volumes that have already been deployed. And when there is a new, or when you want to add a new volume, then DRDB manage. You just say new volume demo, 150 megs, three times replicated. That will be it. It takes a minute. I mean, it, it needs to initialize. And then you can also pull that through the assignments from the resource. Assignments, resource, demo. So this, these three nodes is what we distributed on. The fourth one didn't get it. So That's the one I'm on right now. So what I could do is add a client. So I do not want storage now, but I want the possibility to access this resource. And then I can manually add this node. Here again the request whether it's done with it. One is still creating a connection, but it's locally apparently it's available. And the new status result in DRDB9 you can see here the resource demo next to the other resources. So in the second part here, local disk class, they're up to date. So I can locally access it, but I do not have local storage, but the other three storage do have that in this four node cluster. And basically I can use it as a block device. I would have to do a request, which number that is. I can simply enter the file system. I don't have to look at primary, secondary, or manual. It doesn't really matter. But I just say that it's primary, and then it's initialized. It's quite quick, yeah. Well, I made it really small, so 150 megs, uh, that is something that it can do quite quickly. And now it is very configurable in the cluster. So if I uh, add some cluster resources, I, I don't need the DRDB resource agent that I used to need before. So to, to switch between primary and secondary, and then in the end you had to make sure that this was on the master page with the application group and not on the slave side. So this, it, there were two constraints and two resources and the group underneath with the application in it. So this has become a lot easier. So with one file system resource, you can run it like a local file system would be here now. The 102 directory. I make it SRE. So now I formatted it. Well, what you should always do with the cluster is the, to turn off the file system check. So it doesn't start checking in a, in a bad moment where you, well, you'll need the system. 
You could uh, create a monitoring for it. Here we go. And once we're done, the cluster will look for any system where the file system can be mounted. And the resource is already running, so the file system is already active, does not require a DRDB agent in the back, but it can be mounted just like a normal file system and also moved around. And if we had an application on top of it, I mean, I will not do that because it takes too long, but I mean, I have a dummy. Let's call it pdemo. Then this can be connected to the DRDB very quickly by copying it. So, of course, he would want to start this at any other system, but then these two can be copied, copy demo, first the file system, then the application, and then we have made sure that the application will always run where the DRDB is active. So the cluster configuration in, a, in this uh, setup with Kesslik and Parsec is much easier than it was with the DRDB 8, where it was a lot more complex and complicated. Any questions to about this? Yeah, hello. How does the node know that DRDB is being used as a storage, that, that is using DRDB as a storage, when or if a node um, like gets lost? What do you mean? Well, I have two or three DRDB nodes, and one of them is, well, shutting off. How does my DRDB node, like the, the one that's with the storage, how does it know that it has to send the data somewhere else? Oh, you mean if, a, uh, if another node shuts down, not the one where the application is running, but one of the other ones? Is, is that correct? Yes, so let's say iSCSI. I, I um, provided a storage in the network, then the application does know immediately whether DRDB has lost a DRDB node. Yeah, that's right. With iSCSI, it's a different topic because it depends on which so of the systems is the active iSCSI target. I mean, that's a topic for the cluster. With DRDB itself, it is the case that if I have a DRDB client and, and have created it, and one of the server systems fails, then neither the pacemaker cluster, Corsic, nor the administrator has to really take care of it manually but the DRDB will notice it itself. So once the system fails, this DRDB connection is lost. There is a timeout function. So DRDB nodes have some kind of heartbeat, like a cluster, that checks whether a node is failing. And once it does fail, it has been marked as inactive, and the other nodes notice uh, or just note what has to be replicated from this node, and then the application doesn't really notice or the cluster. I mean, unless it was a, a member of the cluster, then it would be fenced and uh, taken out. But if it's what, it wasn't the node where the application was run on, then I have a storage node, then I can, uh, that has been used as a DRDB9 client, then the failover is fully automatic on, on the server. So this node is gone until it's being reactivated and is starting a, restarting a connection, and this recovery is fully automatic. It's quite interesting, the case, probably, if a node uh, fails where the application is running right now. That's where the pacemaker and coursing cluster uh, come in place. I mean, if the, the, you lose a node with applications on it, then these applications will be restarted on another system. And I mean, you can work with constraints in this case to make sure that if I don't have resources available on one on all the nodes, or, but only on certain nodes, then I want to make sure that it's being started on uh, nodes where the DRDB nodes are already available. Another possibility would be to install a resource agent to, that makes sure that it's being made available. So before the application starts running again, it is somebody has to, or it has to make sure whether that's a node that already has this DRDB or whether we can 
uh, like just add a client for as long the, uh, as the application is running. Once the application has uh, finished or has been migrated, I mean, you can use another smaller node. If you have a large cluster with many nodes, where not every node is always available. It's quite convenient if the cluster is still quite small, as in this case, like up to six nodes would be the small ones, where you have like a three times redundancy to make sure that you will never lose data, even when two systems should fail simultaneously. And then on the rest of the systems, you have the clients, so the application can be started on, on any of the systems at any time. I have a question. The client, is it always from one storage system or from all four? Like as a weight replacement? You mean how often it's being replicated? It's uh, uh, where it's reading from. Is it reading from one node or from several nodes? Now there's load balancing in DRDB 8 already. This has been had been there. If local access through local networks could be quicker, then DRDB is using some kind of a striping function, so the data would normally be read locally, because usually that's the quickest. But if there are other read requests that are coming, or that could be um, handled quicker through the network than locally, then through the load balancing, uh, this would be read from several sources simultaneously. So you can use it also uh, for load balancing purposes, really. And this was already available in DRDB8. I mean, this is one of the features that not many people know about. Maybe I can, I can show this. There is an interactive graph about the clients. About this, I can't really see much. Let's try it this way. So if I have four servers and four, four clients, the network will look like this. I'm not sure if you can see it nicely. So this is one of the servers. The servers are always connected with all the clients. The clients are not connected to all the other clients, but only to all the servers, because it doesn't make sense to have the clients that are, have no storage making them communicate. But every client is communicating with every server. And here the failovers also happen automatically. And the server are, of course, always connected to all the nodes, to every server and to every client which implicates that the number of connections, if they turn into big networks, I mean, they multiply. So that's why we have multicast on our roadmap as well to get traffic down in very large setups. Uh, also request forwarding so you can build chains instead of having this full mesh configuration. And to have some nodes that are only available through a few helps like with the spanning tree protocol, probably, like distributed networks, where you have certain paths to certain nodes, but no direct connection between every node. I have three little questions. First question, uh, so disk as client can be turn to a server in running mode, right? That has a hard drive. If I have a business client, like a DRDB client, can I turn it into a DRDB server uh, while in operation, or would I have to take it out and then make it a server? I mean, if it has storage, I would say it is possible to make it a DRDB server in running operation and also to make a server a client while it's running. But in DRDB managed, we did not implement it. So the data organization uh, interface cannot do this yet because it's uh, also a work in project progress. But technologically, this is possible. So DRDB 8 uh, allowed me to go active active, so to write on both nodes uh, simultaneously. Does this work as well for the 32 nodes in DRDB 9? No, uh, officially it's on two nodes only. In effect, I can tell you that you could turn all the 32 primary. If for the future, this is something we have in mind, or, but it's not been tested sufficiently. 
uh, and nobody would say now that it can be done and should be done. I mean, the two primary does work as it did in uh, the RDB 8. The multi primary is planned, and in the present version, you can activate it if you dare. So for test reasons, you can do that. But it's a feature that we haven't tested yet so far and wouldn't say that it's a good idea for production. But yeah, it's in the works. So finally, in the RDB8, there were problems if I didn't have a block but a RAM disk. Is this problem now fixed in the RDB9? RAM disk does work, as far as I know. I haven't tried it myself. I know one problem with like if you have a loopback device and you produce that, you have a file system, you put the file system on the DRDB, you produce a file inside the file system, you make a meatback device and then loopback device, and then you put it back on the on the DRDB. The kernel has a problem with that. Not It's not DRDB based, but it's a stream interface and uh, the kernel and its layers. There are deadlocks somewhere in the kernel, so this does not work yet. It's not a good idea. But with RAM disks, well, I haven't tried it. I cannot verify anything, but I heard nobody say that this shouldn't work. So should be no problem. Internal metadata, that's, that's something that may not work so well because they are gone once the system is gone. OK. Any further questions? Otherwise, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And those of you who still have questions or who maybe uh, know the, or, uh, uh, they find me later, those of you who still have questions later, in the breaks or in between the presentations. I mean, just come up to me and ask me personally. I'll be here until at least 3, 4 p.m. because then my train is already going back. But yeah, I'm sure you can catch me. So thank you.